Here is another question from one of our viewers who wanted to know why some concrete stairs might have either a raised area at the back or a recessed area in the back here. And most of the time it's going to be because the form boards weren't removed before the concrete was finished. And if you have a raised section, you can see here we have the form and they finish the concrete to the front edge of the form board here. And either the concrete in the step either lowered or would have been finished from the top edge of the form board and then angled back a little bit. And I'm not about to suggest that the forms couldn't be in the wrong spot either to create the raised section like we have here in our example. So again, this section would have either sank a little bit before the concrete dried or would have been angled a little bit with this, or you might have different riser heights throughout the stairway. And if you have a recessed spot, you can see here where the form board was not removed. And we just simply reverse the last few examples. So if you have a form board that was a little too low or a section of the step that would not have been flush or even with the bottom of the form board, then you could end up with a recessed section shaped like the form board they used to build the concrete stairs. Here is another question from one of our viewers. They wanted to know if they could use a rectangular shape for the floor plan winder design instead of the square shape that is most commonly used. And I really don't see why you wouldn't be allowed to use them. However, you would need to check with your local building department to verify that information because some building codes require the smallest part of the step to be six inches. And I'll show you an example of that later on in the video. And for those of you who don't know what this stairway would look like with four foot wide steps on the bottom and five foot wide steps on the upper stairs. And we're going to do the same with these two over here. So let's go ahead and provide you with a view of what this one over here would look like. And then let's go ahead and move over to here. Remember, this is the floor plan layout. The example on the right side of the video should provide you with a little better idea. Now, the reason why I don't think the building department is going to have a problem with this is because the walk lines should be the same if we draw them as circles. And they should be the same if we connect the dots here with a straight line. But it's all going to depend upon how your building department is going to view what a walk line actually looks like for a winder type stair design. And if you notice over here, we got kind of a wild area where you might not have a walk line dimension over here for this section or this section here because we would need a larger circle to go from this point here to about this point here and we're not going to have that in our stair design. And this area here could basically be viewed in the same way as if we did something like this. For example, if a person was to walk from this part of the stairway to this part of the stairway and use this as their walk line, then we're going to have three different measurements. So if I was to remove the circles, we're going to have kind of an out of whack walk line that you could use to represent this section over here. If I was going to walk over to here and then cut up over to here or walk over here to here and then walk up the rest of the way, I'm not going to be following a walk line with equal measurements. And in some cases won't even meet the minimum tread depth for the building codes, which is going to be anywhere between 9 and 11 inches. And a few more walk line patterns that might be a little ridiculous, but could be helped to win your argument if you want to build a rectangular shaped winder stairway. And I don't know if this will help, but let's go ahead and take a look at what it would look like with a winder that's going to have equal dimensions on all four sides instead of this one here. Now last on the list, let's go ahead and take a look at what the minimum of six inches might look like on your winder stairs with a rectangular shaped floor plan layout. And you would need to check with your local building department to see if you need to use this method or if you could bring it tight to the corner to where all four of the front steps will line up at a pivot point like I showed you in the previous examples. And there's a very good chance I didn't answer your question. This is something you're going to need to check with your local building department 
to verify and I would definitely get your plan approved in writing. Get it stamped because the last thing you want to do is get a verbal approval and not have something written down with a signature on it. Do not make this mistake. And again, my main concern with the building codes will be the problem area that I mentioned earlier in the video. Here's an extremely interesting group of stairs leading down to a pool of water. This is in India. I'm not going to bother to pronounce the name of the site. But find stuff like this extremely fascinating. The architecture, the design, and an area where local residents could have gathered water years ago. Now, I don't know if they still use this today. But I would also like to point out that this looks extremely dangerous. I just couldn't imagine falling off the side of one of these stairs and then possibly getting knocked unconscious as I fall into the water or continue to fall until I hit one of these landings. But you know, somebody at one point or time was walking down one of these stairs and either tripped or was pushed. And depending upon which direction those people were pushed would depend upon their fate. And then if you're carrying large containers to fill the water up with, would you have to be an acrobat to balance all of that stuff? And then what would happen to the people below if one of those containers filled with water or empty containers fell from above? So enough of the doom and gloom. I would imagine projects like these are where most of our modern day building codes came from. And if you have anything to say about that, let us know in the comment area if you like the design or if you've ever been here and walked all the way down to the bottom and then actually made it back up to the top to live to tell about it. In this video, I'm going to try and explain why you can't make the stair steps longer when you're dealing with tight spaces. And I've made plenty of videos like this before, but I'm just going to give it another shot because I had someone request this recently. So here goes. I'm going to try it again. If I have a step that's nine inches, then there's a very good chance I can make it 10 inches, but I'm not going to change the length of the step in reference to the measurements required for the building codes. So let me see if I can provide you with a couple of examples here. Here we have a nine inch step, nine inch step, and the riser is seven and a half inches, even though that's not important. Now, if we add an inch to that, then we're now going to have a 10 inch wide step. And if I add another inch and a half to that, I'm going to have an 11 and a half inch step. And that's going to work out better when you're going up the stairs. You're going to have more room for larger feet. So here we have about an 11 and a half inch step with an undercut. And it's obviously going to be a little bit deeper, again, providing you with more room to put your feet on when you're going up the stairs. However, that's not going to be the case when you're walking down the stairs. And I think this is the reason why the building code is framed that way. So again, you're going to have a little easier time going up the stairs than you will be going down the stairs. So here I have the two stairways. And if I remove the extension to create the undercut, which is basically an overhang, I'm going to end up with this. You can see where we're going here. But I get it, you might not be able to see where we're going here. So let's go ahead and take a look at the one with the two inch nosing on it. So again, I've got this much depth and I can tuck my feet underneath the nosing here to step on this step here. However, that's not going to be the case when I'm going down the stairs. I'm still going to have a nine inch step. Next up, let me draw some lines in here to see if this will make a little more sense with our nine inch step. So here I have nine inches for the depth of each step with a one inch nosing or one inch overhang. However, I'm not positioned in the same way that I would have if I didn't have a nosing on it. So to fix this, all I would need to do would be to move the layout measurements forward one inch or leave the measurements where they are and then move the stairway back to where the front of the nosing lines up with the measurements that we need for our floor plan layout. And if I use the stairway design with the longer nosing, then all I need to do is move that back a little bit further. And the reason why I'm showing you this is to provide you with an example of how you can actually add a nosing or an undercut and rebuild the entire stairway. 
to make it easier walking up the stairs. However, it's not going to change anything when you're walking down the stairs. You're not going to take your feet and turn them around, or at least I wouldn't think you would. However, you could if that's going to make it safer for you to walk down a stairway with smaller steps. Here is another problem that I continue to see showing up over and over again. And that's people using some type of a concrete paver or sm small product they believe is strong enough to support the stair stringers. And I'm not about to suggest that you're ever going to have a problem doing this. But I would like to point out a couple of things for you to consider before doing it. And the first thing I want to point out is that it wouldn't be a bad idea to move these back to prevent a possible trip hazard. And next on the list will be to make sure that your riser heights are the same all the way through the stairway, that they are consistently the same measurement, or at the very least within 3 8 of an inch for the maximum variation between the minimum and maximum rise. The next problem I have found in a variety of different pictures and videos all over the internet is this problem here where we have a high first step. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to try and line the edge of the pavers up with the edge of the stringers to prevent a trip hazard on this side if you're not going to be building a handrail. Sometimes if you attach a handrail to the side of the stairs, then that will force people to go a little further around the stairway before entering it. If not, you're going to have people from the side jumping up on the first step here and then working their way up. And make sure that the stringers are full bearing on your paver supports or whatever you're using. So this might require you to buy a couple of more pavers. And an example of an unsupported stair stringer at the bottom would look something like this. And the next thing I want to point out is it wouldn't be a bad idea to have a nosing on all of the stair steps. If you're not going to be installing a riser, you're going to be surprised at how many times someone's going to walk up a stairway like this and hit the edge of the stringer or the edge of the paver. So if you can, set them back a little bit. In our example here, I moved the pavers and the edge of the stringer back one inch. However, if I don't put a nosing on the rest of the steps, I could still end up with somebody, while they're walking up the stairs, ram the edge of their shoe up against the face of the stringer here. So if you can, put a nosing on it. If not, it's not going to be the end of the world, depending upon how often the stairs are going to be used, which will be another thing to consider when using pavers. Now, it wouldn't be a bad idea to connect the stringers to the pavers to prevent them from separating. However, it might not make any difference at all if you don't have the pavers securely fastened to the ground. And this is where using a concrete footing might be better than using pavers. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment area, and I will try to answer them as soon as possible. And thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, let us know by hitting the thumbs up button or letting us know in the comment area.